we'll probably need to do much introduction of Ken Hartman because you've been hanging out with him for the bulk of today. Uh, but Ken is awesome, man. I've known Ken for a minute. Ken's got a lot of awesome background, a lot of experience. And as I said, Ken has been, uh, he's been heavily involved in cloud for a lot of organizations ranging from, you know, high tech to a number of others. And so he's sort of seen where people are struggling and trying to make sure that they're encompassing the latest in business requirements, even though they might be difficult to overcome. And I think this topic does justice to that, right? Doing cloud in China I mean, the number of enterprise organizations out there that have some form of, you know, investment in China or partnerships in China, whatever the case may be, China's a little bit of a different, uh, different beast to, to tackle there. So I'm really excited to hear from Ken on this, and I'm not going to hold us up anymore. So Ken, take it away, man. All right. Thank you. So Brian, can I present? So give me a thumbs up in the Cloud Security Summit uh, channel if your organization is doing uh, any compute workloads in mainland China, that would be great. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen here. I'm getting an error saying I can't share screen. There we go. Yeah, there, Ken. Share a screen, and I need to choose that screen, okay. Okay, so, um, there's a chance that if you're not currently doing computing in China, you may end up. And we're gonna talk about that. So <coughs> Dave Shack, he's already introduced me, uh, but I do wanna throw out that I am a graduate of the Science Technology Institute Master's in Information Security Program. So uh, feel free to ping me about that as well in the virtual hallway. So we're gonna talk about, well, why China? We're gonna talk about global market data particularly with respect to China. And then we're gonna talk about the cloud service providers in China. We're gonna talk about the special requirements to operate in the cloud in China as either a cloud service provider or a, <coughs> a cloud customer. And then we're gonna talk about what AWS and Azure have done so that they can offer cloud services out of mainland China. And then we're going to do a demo of Alibaba. <clears throat> it's kind of funny because when we put in the chat, you know, which cloud service providers are you using? Somebody was like, Alibaba, who put that in there? So um, that was me kind of seeding it just for fun. So um, haven't seen any thumbs up in the chat yet as to, uh, no, there might be one. Let me look. Okay, there's uh, at least a couple. Uh, so uh, Hong Kong is separate because they don't have quite as much as much tight control over cloud service providers in Hong Kong, but um, we know things are definitely shifting. So um, China's really starting to uh, clamp down on the freedoms uh, that the citizens in Hong Kong have. So something to also watch. All right, so moving on. Now the blue quotes are from Sun Tzu. And every time I read quotes from Sun Tzu, I realize that I don't quite have that mindset that he did. One thing is for sure, there is extremely large market opportunities in China. However, they may come at a price. And I put down their intellectual property, quote unquote, transfers. Um, that's a tough decision that companies have to make because um, often by doing business in China, especially in the cloud, you might be essentially giving them a copy of your important and critical intellectual property. Uh, it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens as a result of all the fallout with COVID-19. And uh, so the COVID stuff came kind of at the tail end of, or at least what we had hoped would be the tail end of a, a trade war with China as a result of various sanctions and stuff. So not trying to get political, um, but these are all things that we need to be aware of as we assess the risks to our organization. So the global cloud market in 2020, these are 2020 numbers, is expected to hit $411 billion US. Of that, China has 103.6 billion US. So right at one quarter of the global cloud market. That's why companies like AWS and Azure want a piece of it. 
So uh, what's interesting is I found some a, a news bulletin that said that Alibaba's cloud conference in 2018 hosted 120,000 participants. Now contrast that to reInvent, which is quite huge. If you go to Las Vegas, uh, it's just a zoo during reInvent. And that peaks out at about 50 to 60,000 people. Now, I've only seen this listed once. And one of the challenges with information coming out of China is we never know if it's completely truthful. So I looked for a 2019 number and was unable to find something. Now, um, but they did have a conference in 2019. And, and maybe it was in Chinese and, and I don't read Chinese. Um, so this slide is pretty interesting. Um, we can see that as of 2023, it's expected to hit uh, 623 billion. Now, what we're interested in is the slice of the pie with the, the stars, because that is Asia Pacific. Now, um, one thing to note is uh, companies in the Asia Pacific, even if they're not in China, are much more likely to use a Chinese cloud service provider. RightScale has for the last several years been doing what they call their state of the cloud report. It is essentially a survey of a bunch of different businesses, enterprises, as to um, what different trends they're seeing in the cloud. Now, um, from this, we're seeing that 61% of, of respondents said that they're using AWS and 52% said that they're using Azure. So their huge takeaway, or one of the main takeaways was that 84% of respondents have a multi-cloud strategy. Now, you do see numbers from Alibaba down here, and um, that's coming in at 3%. Now, it's quite unlikely that RightScale didn't have much penetration into China in terms of getting uh, responses to their survey. What I like about this next page, so the, that slide says which cloud service providers are being used. This one shows how much each cloud service provider is being used. So what can we see? We can see that Amazon is pretty much holding steady at about 40%. Microsoft uh, is about half that, but look at the uh, rate of uh, inflection here. They're, um, they're definitely um, hot on Amazon's heels. We also see that Google has an increase in market share, but nowhere near as steep as what we're seeing from Microsoft. And what we um, were also seeing with, uh, with Alibaba was that they were um, ramping at, up at about the same rate as Google, except for uh, in, in 2019. And I'm going to I don't know exactly what that was, but I suspect it might have had something to do with the trade war. Now, here is a list of some of the cloud service providers in China, Alibaba, Kingsoft, uCloud, Tencent. Now, you're probably familiar with Tencent because they are the creators of the very popular app called WeChat, which is um, uh, probably every bit as popular as Slack or, uh, you know, any one of our favorite instant messaging uh, platforms here in the U.S. There are foreign providers that operate in China, uh, AWS and Azure for, for certain. And I have market share numbers that I'll show you next. And then IBM and Oracle and VMware, they have a presence, but um, it's uh, a very low percentage. One thing that is not on this list of foreign providers is Google Cloud Platform. And Google has historically had a very troubled relationship with China, um, with China trying to censor Google search results. So from the website headspace.org.au. Sometimes okay, Google canceled. That wasn't for you. Um, I think uh, we're getting. Uh, Sorry, I don't understand. Uh, that happens when I teach on my phone too. So I've tried to mute all that in my my devices. Okay, so we're not seeing um, uh, Google listed here. This slide shows uh, market share for uh, China. What you'll see is that Alibaba has a significant lead over any of their competition. And then the next player is Tencent, followed by China Telecom, AWS, and Huawei. And this is 2019 numbers coming from IDC. What is interesting is that the top five cloud service providers control 
75% of the market in China. Now, part of what protects Chinese owned service providers is that to operate within mainland China, you have to have a value added telecom permit. Now, these permits are only issued to Chinese companies that have less than 50% foreign investment. So um, what you saw with AWS is that they formed a joint venture with a local Chinese company. So that way they had investment, but it wasn't a controlling percentage. And the way that it will typically work is the Chinese company will operate the data center and then take care of um, a lot of the compliance issues, uh, the red tape from the Chinese state government and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot to be said about having that local liaison, but this, of course, is also a huge point of contention in the uh, China trade war. And it seems to me that this requirement was only implemented in the last uh, five or six years. So before that, um, so, so this is a relatively new requirement, this value-added telecom permit. Now, if you're a cloud customer in China, uh, you must prove your identity. And um, I'm gonna show you this when I demo Alibaba Cloud. So this authentic identity information bit. And if you are offering um, internet content, you also will have to obtain a, a special operating license. And I'll talk about that on the next slide as well. So uh, there's paperwork, but your uh, Chinese cloud service provider, whether it's AWS, Azure, or um, say Alibaba, they will facilitate the um, obtaining of these permits for you. Now, if you do have the permit to display um, internet content, you must display that on your website and also include it in your sales collateral. A little bit more about what an internet content provider must do. Well, there's this application process where you submit a um, form to the China Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. And again, this can be done by the hosting provider, often through a web-based form in their console. Commercial internet content providers have to get an ICP license where non-commercial web content providers just need to do what is called a filing. But without that appropriate permit, your domain name is gonna be blocked and so will your website. Now in China, AWS has two separate regions. Uh, there's the Beijing region and the Ningxia region. region. And these, each region is um, hosted by a separate company which is a joint venture with AWS. <coughs> and it's operated as a separate partition. So those of you that are familiar with GovCloud, you know that you can't access GovCloud resources using your AWS global credentials. The same way with AWS China. It's an entirely separate partition. So what does this mean? Well, you can't do VPC peering. You can't assume a role from AWS Global into AWS China or vice versa and so forth. The other thing that you see, and this is just like GovCloud, is that not all AWS services are available. Now in GovCloud, it's because they have to meet the um, government restrictions and so forth and meet various approval processes. I suspect that part of the reason that there's a lag in China is because of the transfer of intellectual property into uh, mainland China. Another thing that surprised me when my security team was trying to secure um, my company, I was, this was when I was working for Illumina, and Illumina is a provider of gene sequencing equipment and uh, uh, informatic services for analyzing the sequenced genes. There's no root credentials for AWS accounts, and that kind of blew us away. So what we had to do was we had to create a uh, IAM user account that was that in case of an emergency break class account, we gave it full administrative privileges to the account. Um, but that way we at least had 
that in case of emergency break glass. And also, if you read the documentation, there's no free tier. Now, another thing that kind of threw us for a loop was when we started converting our scripts. Here we see the format of AWS resource names, where it's ARN, all, they always start with ARN, then you see partition, service region, account, I, account ID and resource ID, and then, or sometimes resource type and resource ID. Now in uh, AWS Global, it's just AWS, but in China it's AWS hyphen CN. And for those of you that are familiar with GovCloud, that's AWS hyphen US hyphen Gov. Also, there's only two regions in China. So here's their name, CN North One and CN Northwest One. So um, what we had done with a lot of our scripts that we use for security monitoring was we um, had hard coded both the partition as well as the region, US East One. And then what, would, what we would do is we'd say, all right, what other regions are there currently in uh, AWS Global? And then we would iterate through each of those just to do um, an inventory to see if um, there's any assets in any region that we didn't expect. So we had to modify that so that we are no longer hard coding the regions as well. And at the bottom of the slide, I'm really just showing you what um, an ARN for say an EBS volume would look like in the Beijing region in the AWS partition. Now Azure, is similar to AWS in that they have a completely separate instance of the Azure cloud in China. And that is hosted by Shanghai Blue Cloud, Blue cloud Technology Company, just known as Blue Cloud for short. And um, they have their data centers in Eastern and Northern China with over a hundred, I mean, sorry, a thousand kilometers of separation. And um, when we talk about Azure China, lumped in there is also Office 365 and the Power BI tool. So that's all hosted by Blue Cloud within China mainland. Another point that I wanted to make with respect to um, both Azure and AWS is that the portal or the AWS console and even the CLI can be accessed from anywhere on the internet. So um, I had team members in um, uh, Silicon Valley as well as the United Kingdom that would provide security services support and monitoring for our accounts within the uh, China regions from their home offices or from the, uh, the company office located in the US or in the UK. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, Great Firewall of China. And um, I want you to note how delicately this is written in the Azure documentation. The network latency between China and the rest of the world is inevitable because of the intermediary technologies that regulate cross-border internet traffic. Website users and administrators might experience slow performance. Uh, other documentation, uh, well, I'm citing Azure specifically, but I've seen this with other cloud service providers, is that um, it's often three times the latency that it would be um, us accessing cloud services in the US, based in the US, or a Chinese user accessing cloud services within China. And that's because of that great firewall of China. Now, um, you can have a VPN. So even though you can't do VPC peering or uh, yeah, VPC peering between your Azure or AWS um, partition and the China partition or the Azure instance in China, you can do VPNs. Uh, but you do have to, uh, according to the documentation, get permission from the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. And, and those uh, VPNs aren't always guaranteed to have connectivity. And I'll talk about that on this slide where I'm gonna cover the different technologies that the Great Firewall of China uses. So um, as a firewall, it is essentially a man in the middle. So it's at the edge of the Chinese uh, networks and it is capable of uh, doing filtering 
and anything that a man in the middle attacker could do, the Great Wall of China could do. So there's, um, it's been known to do DNS spoofing. So for example, if you're trying to hit um, uh, google.com and we would expect an address like 8.8.8.8, .8 they could substitute that because DNS is not a secure protocol, right? It's just a text in the clear. So they could substitute that for an IP address to a domain name server of their choosing. Uh, so it uh, can operate just like a transparent proxy. Um, it can also do TCP reset attacks. So the way that a TCP reset attack would work is if uh, what, so there's the, the TCP three-way handshake, right? So you send a SYN and then you get a SYN act back. And then um, uh, when you're done, it'll send a FIN, meaning that you're planning to close down the, uh, the TCP session in an orderly manner. There's also a reset that can be sent, which says, nope, wrong, stop it now. So even though the TCP reset is not coming from the two parties involved in the sessions coming from the man in the middle, the, the Great Firewall of China can send the reset actually to both the client and the server if it's so desired. Another thing that's interesting uh, is that the uh, Chinese uh, state government can obtain the root certificate from any Chinese-based certificate authority. So they can impersonate any uh, secure web server that was um, that has that Chinese root certificate in their chain of trust. There's also been um, examples documented where they've used um, uh, certificates that have been signed by an Egypt-based certificate authority, which may have been funded by Chinese money. Uh, and if ever they wanted to, they can always just black hole a IP coming or destined to a specific IP address range. Uh, typically what you'll see though is you won't see that your traffic is completely blocked, but what they'll do is they'll increase the quality of service penalty for the traffic as a means of disincentivizing you to use say maybe US-based cloud services or US-based websites to stick within China. Uh, the other thing that has been known to happen is active probing from the same um, IP addresses that support the Great Wall of China. So for example, um, many uh, dissidents will try and use um, a VPN to get their message out of uh, mainland China to the rest of the world. So they'll try and use a VPN. And there's been reports where um, uh, during and after that VPN session, they were actively probed. Okay, so next what I want to do is get into a hands-on demo of Alibaba Cloud. So um, what I'm going to do is just show you the array of products they have, show you how to access the documentation. Uh, and oh, by the way, the purpose of this is not to convince you to run production workloads in Alibaba Cloud. The purpose of this talk is to just make you aware of what other cloud services providers are out there and that as uh, security professionals, it behooves us to have companies like these on our radar. I'm gonna demo that real name registration. We're gonna look at resource and access management. We're even gonna launch an instance and connect to it. Then we're gonna terminate it. We'll also look at the configuration of the security group. So I'm gonna uh, now pop over to my web browser. All right, so um, to find Alibaba Cloud, use Bing or Google your favorite search engine and just type in Alibaba Cloud and you'll find a way to sign up and uh, just like Azure, Google Cloud Platform and AWS, you'll be given uh, free credits to play around with. All right, so I'm gonna authenticate and then I have multi-factor authentication set up. So I need to pull up my Google Authenticator. Okay, um, and by the way, if ever you see Alian, that's um, another name for Alibaba Cloud. All 
All right, so now I'm authenticated. All right, so um, here what you see is the main dashboard. Okay, it brought me right into the uh, compute service because that's what I used last. But if we want to take a look at the products, um, just like in uh, the AWS console, you can see how they're grouped by, um, you know, by compute or by networking. Now, notice the word elastic. You know, and here we thought that AWS had a lock on the word elastic. Well, Alibaba Cloud would beg to differ, so they use that. The other uh, thing that I thought was funny is down here under security services, they have security center, which, uh, you know, is very similar to what Azure does. So you're going to see some stuff in here that's very much like AWS and other stuff that is very much like um, Azure or Google Cloud Platform. One of the things that I do like is they have a cloud shell. One of the things that I really wish AWS would do is that they would implement a cloud shell. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this out into another window here, and then I'm going to um, come back to the cloud shell here in a minute, I'll close this instance of it. All right, so um, before I get into launching a virtual machine, first I want to go to another service, and um, that service, let's see here. There it is. Uh, I was looking for the recently visited and I wasn't seeing that in the previous page, which is a, a UI inconsistency. All right, so resource access management is very similar to identity and access management in AWS. You'll even see that they have their own version of security advisor where it's making recommendations as to how to improve my account configuration, the, the security of my account. I can even download a user credential report or download a security report. Now the security report is really just a summary, whereas the credential report is very similar to the credential report in AWS. It's a CSV and it contains a list of all of my users. <coughs> now I created this so that we could use it in SEC 488. So I have two groups configured, an admins group and a students group. So let's take a look at our students. Um, so here well, it lists of our users. So here I have the various admins. We also have Kyle Dickinson in our audience for the uh, Cloud Summit. And Kyle is one of the co-authors of SEC488. So shout out to Kyle, thank you. And uh, then down here, we have the uh, students that we provision using a script for our first beta. Our second beta is gonna be in mid-August. And then down here, you can see policies. We can use, uh, Aliyun managed policies, or we can create our own. So very similar to access and identity management in AWS. All right, let's launch us a virtual machine. So I'm gonna go into the Elastic Compute Service, not to be confused with the AWS Elastic Container Service. All right, so I'm gonna click Create Instance. All right, now some things to note is down at the bottom, it'll tell you your instance price. I like that. Um, and it will recalculate as I make different decisions. So the default is subscription with a duration of one month. So that's what my bill is. So I always try and remember to do pay as you go, because I'm only going to do a demo here. So I'm about uh, uh, nine cents per hour. So I'm going to change this to a region in China. <coughs> Let her randomly choose the availability zone. And uh, let's click next. Now I'm getting this message. So according to the PR, People's Republic of China laws, uh, users who purchase servers must provide real name registration. So to do that, I would click this. And um, I'm brought to a tab for my root account management where I'm given the opportunity to provide my um, identification. So the choice is passport or driver's license. Here I'd put my passport number, provide my full name 
as shown on my passport. And then I would upload a photo of my passport. Now, I have made the personal risk decision not to do that. However, if ever I traveled to mainland China, you know that they would take a picture of that using some sort of border entry control. So I don't see it as a huge risk, but for me, it was a risk that I didn't need to take because I'm gonna play with their technology in a US-based region and I'm not gonna run production workloads, right? I'm just playing around. So let's go create instance. And um, I wanna change it to US Silicon Valley, which happens to be where I live. And then I wanna just do an entry level. So this would be something equivalent to the T2 micro instance that we might run in uh, our nano instance that we would run in say AWS. So here it's one virtual CPU, half a gigabyte. All right, so, um, oh, I need to also make it pay as you go. I'm noticing the price is $5, not uh, pennies. So change that to pay as you go. All right, much better. So down in the neighborhood of a penny. All right, um, the next thing that I wanna do is choose which image. So um, here I can choose CentOS, Ubuntu, but I'll just leave that at Allion Linux. Then I would choose the particular version. And um, I, I'm gonna just change this to 20, which is the smallest uh, disk I can use according to the way that their system is designed. And um, all right, so now I'm down to uh, less than a penny per hour. Next is uh, networking. And um, I'm just gonna use the security group. Before we're done though, we're gonna take a look at the um, security group configuration, which is slightly different than it is in, um, in AWS. Uh, notice they also use the word elastic for their network interfaces. That uh, kind of makes me chuckle. All right, and then I'm gonna click next system configuration. Um, I'm just gonna let it use the default instance name. I'm gonna give it a host name of ken-test. And um, I can even have it sequentially incremented if I was gonna launch multiple instances. And then um, next, I can uh, select a tag. I'm gonna give it a user of Ken, just so that I have a tag I can put on it. And then next preview. Now it's recalculating the price. Um, oh, and then down here for login credentials, um, I haven't set that yet. So I can change that by clicking change settings. And that will bring me to a different place where I can say, do I wanna use a key pair or a password? So for the purposes of this demo, I'm just gonna use a password and I'm gonna set it. So try and guess my password. Sure, you could brute force it without too much trouble. And notice that I'm logging in as root, all right? So now um, I need to pick up where I was in the wizard. So uh, here's where the tags are applied. Next preview, looking everything over, it's pay as you go. That's good. Um, here's my VPC um, password. Okay, so next I'm gonna click create instance. And then, oh, you need to read and accept the terms, the terms of service. And I always forget that because it's kind of hidden and you have to do it every time you use the uh, launch wizard here in the console. All right, creation failed. A security risk with your account. Oh, sure. <laughs> I've done this like, I've done this demo like five times getting ready for it. So maybe they're, um, all right. So it doesn't look like we're gonna be able to uh, create an instance. Try it one more time, no. All right, so unfortunately we're not gonna be able to create an instance. Um, there's a couple things that I wanted to point out. Um, let me go back to the console. So I'm gonna click, uh, I just close this tab. Um, going back to the EC, so if I had any instances running, I could see them listed under here. Oh, let me see something. Under console overview, two security risks handle. Urgent vulnerabilities. All right, so, um, 
All right, I'm not gonna deal with that. Uh, so um, that's the security center that um, I was telling you about. So I'm not gonna spend any time there. Um, now, what is interesting about the um, console is I can SSH using just the public IP address or I can use VNC. So if I was looking at my instances and if I actually had an instance, I should have made a screenshot, um, I would be able to under actions go connect. And then what it would do is it would create a VNC session and it would give me a, v, a VNC password to use to complete the VNC session. So I could do all that from the console. I would still have to log in using my um, root user and the corresponding password or key. All right, so one last thing is taking a look at the security groups. So if I go into security groups, um, oh, that was my issue. Is it, is it put me into the China region for some reason? All right, um, I need to switch into the Silicon Valley region to find my security group. All right, so here's my security group. And um, take a look, do you notice the forbids which would be deny or allow. So in AWS, security groups that are blank are denied by default, and then you specifically allow. So um, when I was using the launch wizard, getting ready for this demo, it said, do you wanna use SSH? I said, yes. Do you wanna use uh, RDP? I said, no. So what it did was, I think this was the template one where it gave you ICMP, SSH, and RDP but then it added in this forbid for um, RDP because I had said, no, I don't need to use RDP. Another very interesting thing is we, if we look at the outbound rules, it says by default security groups allow all outbound traffic. And then um, so with nothing in there. Uh, so in uh, SEC 545, as an example, uh, Shaq's, course that he authored, one of the things that we teach him is to make a quarantine security group is you remove all the, um, the rules. But here in the inbound, if we removed all the rules, you'd have wide open access to that uh, any uh, uh, instances that have this security group attached to it. So anyway, I thought that would be uh, kind of fun to, to point out. All right, so um, we're quickly coming to an end here. So I wanted to cover one more thing and that has to do with a comparison of the CLI between Alibaba Cloud and AWS. So just like with the AWS CLI, you run the configure command. So over here it's Alien configure. And then we provide the access key ID, the access key secret. We say which region, how we want our output to be defaulted. But we also have a language that we would need to specify, the, the two-digit or two-character language uh, symbol. And notice the typo. I left that alone. I didn't fix it. Um, and then this next command is to create a virtual machine. In AWS, it's run hyphen instances. Now, notice it over here, ECS, create instance. And notice the mixed case. That is a different convention than when, what you see over here in AWS, even though much of everything else is very similar. And um, these are the exact API calls that Alien uses. And so the CLI implements the commands exactly as the API call, which is different than what AWS does. Uh, also the switches are mixed case as well. Um, here we're specifying a key pair rather than a password. There's a different switch for the password. And then we're also setting a host name. Another difference is I can only create one instance at a time using this particular command. So when I first saw this, I was like, well, that's a pretty blatant ripoff. I mean, they've pretty much copied the AWS command line interface code directly. But then I was like, oh yeah, it's in GitHub. So anybody that wants to can fork it and the Alien CLI is also in GitHub. So again, the purpose of this talk is not to convince you to use Alibaba Cloud for production workload services, but you may have an acquisition, a business partner who is. So it does behoove you to be aware of what the other cloud service providers do, how they look and feel. 
one of the premises behind Security 488, uh, Cloud Security Essentials, is that we wanted you to be exposed to a bunch of different cloud service providers so you can start seeing patterns and similarities, as well as be aware of the differences from provider to provider. So what I'm encouraging you to do is embrace that hacker ethic. Poke the box, see what's different, see what works, what doesn't work, and also what breaks. Now, if you are operating in China though, you need to be very aware of what the China cybersecurity laws are. So in the slide uh, notes, I've got a link to uh, a reference on the cybersecurity laws in China. But in general, explore as many cloud services as possible. Um, it's kind of like learning how to say hello and do some basic conversation in as many different languages as you can. And with that, um, we'll turn it over for questions and I'll stop sharing. Awesome. Well, I would expect nothing less, Ken, you know, I mean, I had pretty, I had pretty high expectations, you know, to be fair. And you met those. So uh, thanks. <laughs> so it's always great to get some, um, some sort of real perspective. And, and I just want to emphasize to guys that, uh, you know, again, this is a snippet of Ken and Kyle's new class, which is, um, I think what you guys have the second beta coming up to you know pretty soon right i think you guys have that coming up pretty pretty shortly yep, mid-august yep is that in august okay yeah so this uh this class has been a long time in the making it's about to burst out into the mainstream sans catalog and uh again can't recommend it highly enough certainly a lot of really foundational and fundamental topics that you know again goes vastly beyond just the snippet that ken presented but um i do have one question that came in ken Mm -hmm. um, and this is coming in from John Erickson, and he says, uh, you know, and, and, and I sort of laughed when I read this question. I think you might a, a little bit, too. He said, well, you know, you articulated many reasons why the U.S. and other non apac enterprises should not do cloud in China. <laughs> what are the reasons that we do use cloud services in China? And I sort of said, well, I, yeah, I, I get that question. Yeah, I mean, if, if you had to present that contrarian view, like what's the good you know, reason to go do this, aside from just, hey, you have to, what, what would you say? Uh, they're, they're smart, they're hungry, they're motivated, um, you know, think, so this talk was not at all to be slated against any, any ethnic group or people. I mean, the, the Chinese Americans that are working in our tech companies are very devoted to, to their employers as well. So, um, uh, what they're they're great consumers just like we are you know they're they're hungry they're and many of them are affluent so there's a lot of money to be made over in china um but it's a it's a calculated decision that most companies are making as to um what intellectual property do we actually want to host in in china so um i would say that we've got um uh slack channels we have an aws and azure one so feel free to chime in on uh, China topics in those uh, groups because I would love to hear you know more about any cloud specific experiences. We've also got folks here from Microsoft, so um, I'd love to hear Microsoft's perspective if they know it um, on on operating in in China. But uh, yeah, there's money to be made, and uh, the, you know the thing with intellectual property is it has value for a short period of time, right? And um, so you want to be first to market. That's when you make all your money. But then after that, everybody's seen it, they figured it out, and it's not all that hard often to reverse engineer. So then it's like, all right, well, then let's make money by having additional people use it. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a good point. It, it's, it's one of those things where I'd say, uh, you know, gosh, I don't want to throw numbers around, but I mean, it certainly seems like the vast majority of large global enterprises have something to do with China, right? So, yeah. I mean, it makes sense that <laughs> given the way that they do business, um, you know, there's, there's certainly, there's certainly certain things that we're going to have to figure out whether we like it or not. Right. I think there's a, a lot of turmoil certainly going on currently um, for about a million reasons that everybody's aware of. <laughs> so neither Ken nor myself need to get into any of the specifics of those politically, you know, pandemically. I don't even know if that's a word, but yeah, we all get it. Right. There's a lot of stuff going on, yeah. um, but business has still got to go. And cloud is, is going to be a big part of that. So I think 
whether it's today or a couple months from now, uh, I think a lot of organizations are going to be in a boat where that, you know, if they haven't had to go there, they're going to be having those conversations. Mm-hmm. Yep, indeed. Excellent. Well, thanks, Ken, so much for giving us uh, the, the final talk of the day. And um, that wraps up the content for the day. So.